week. Either my age is catching up to me, or there's something in these notes that somebody is trying to foil. So we need to be careful. If there's any one of you that accepted a package or something from somebody on your way in here, it might have something in it that's I, a lot of people at work think I'm really weird. Because <laughs> I'll say something to them, it's so off the wall, and I won't even smile. You know, they're, they're, they gotta be thinking, this guy's really weird. <laughs> Brian, on the other hand, sometimes I'll have a conversation with Brian and, and he'll say to me, because it's just the way, just my character makeup, you know, I'll, I'll do this or, I'll, you know, I'll make a weird face or something. He, he'll say to me, why do you always get upset every time we talk? I said, Brian, I'm not getting upset. <laughs> you know, th that, that's really what upsets me. You know, it's like <laughs> when, when somebody comes up to you and says, oh, what are you having a bad day today? Oh. Yeah, I'm having a bad day. I'll tell you what a bad day is. A, a bad day is my wife uh, watches our granddaughter, so we decided to, t to take my little office space that I have and convert it into a kid's room. So that happens to be where the computer was. So I snaked the, the uh, cable down back through the floor snapped a little piece off it in the front, you know. Of course, you need a special crimping tool to put it back on or so. Do you really? <laughs> Stop in my house this week. Actually, give me a couple of days because the, it's about to move, the Wi-Fi is about to move again. So I got it downstairs, so n now, th the first thing, if you get a, if you get a, a Wi-Fi router, the first thing it says on there, do not place the unit in a basement. All right, so, so nobody's got a signal upstairs now. So I've been, I've been fiddling around with it. Finally, I don't know what I did to it, but my wife actually, I should have apologized to her because I got a little snappy. She opens the cellar door and she goes, what's burning down here? Well, I don't know what I did to it, but something must have cooked inside of it. So I brought it to Spectrum and they gave me another unit. No questions asked. So I said, can you check this to see if it works? We don't have the capabilities here of checking it. I'll just give you a new one. I said, all right. So I got a new one, hooked it up. With a new Wi-Fi router, you get a new password. I have a Wi-Fi printer. The printer says, I don't know that router. You know, and I can't, I couldn't, I fiddled around with it for a while. I couldn't get it. Brian told me what to do. I tried that, it didn't work. Finally, I, I called up uh, the company that handles my, ma my malware on my computer, and I, I swear I was talking to somebody from China. I have the hardest time understanding sometimes, you know? And uh, I was on the phone. I finally ended up with a technician that spoke very good English. But I was on the phone for almost two hours. Two hours in my basement. It's hot down there, really hot in my basement. So finally he got it hooked up for me. So I said, oh, I got it hooked up. Well, I was halfway through writing what I had on my mind, so I printed it out. I said, I'm not gonna take a chance. So today, I went to print the other half of it. And my printer said, no, my computer said, there's another computer accessing your printer. Okay, there, there isn't. There wasn't. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, my printer developed a split personality or something. So my second half of my notes were gone. So in the midst of all that, I grabbed my bot, well, in the midst of all that, I said, you know what, I'm going to labor with this thing. I'm going to get this word across. I got my phone out, took some pictures of it. 
I said, How, I wonder if I can open this far enough. I'll probably be able to see one word and have to keep sliding it back and forth. So uh, we left. I got here. I got my Bible. Where's my notes? My notes are home in a basement. I had to go back home to get the notes. I said, well, I, I probably, so I can either try printing it, printing it again, and I knew it wasn't going to work. So I, ha so I have my phone. I know, I've, I know how to send pictures from my phone to my computer at work. So I sent the two pictures that I took on my, it, it actually looks like something that was done on, uh, what they, papyrus? I can see it though, it's pretty big. Yeah, tablets, but I got all my notes here, so without further ado, I've been hearing a lot of different words, and where I was originally gonna go was Stephen rang my bell a couple of weeks ago when he said, and I don't remember if I ever heard this before, Adam, Adam and Eve didn't have belly buttons. Which, that, to me, that was like, that was revelation. Adam and Eve, they, you said something about them not having belly buttons. Yeah. And, and Tim said something about uh, God creating man in, uh, it was in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, and again, I think in 7 or 8, and then Brother Bud started talking about Cain and Abel. So I said, I know, I know, because God's been dealing with me on, with this. I know what God wants me to say. There's actually uh, two things in Genesis to do with creation. And when I started doing the notes, God said, no, you're not ready for that. My wife says, what are you preaching on? It's something very controversial. I'll just give you a little taste of it. It's, it, part of it's in my notes to do it with creating. When God creates, the word is bara. And it's only, it's only tied in with God. When God creates, he uses nothing to create something. There's nothing. He just grabs something out of nowhere and creates, okay? That's the only, the only time you'll find anything to do with God creating something, that word will be used, bara. There's another word that's also used for man creating, but it has to do with taking material things to, uh, to create something. So, so there's an account in Genesis that uh, talks about God creating man and woman. Then another verse or two down, or three, I forget, it mentions God forming Adam from the ground. From, from the earth. Okay, so that, to me, there was a connection there between that and what you said about Cain getting married. I said, where did a woman come from? So there's something consistent there with God creating man and woman out of nothing and taking Adam and e Adam, Adam specifically, and forming him out of the earth, okay? Now, any more than that, and I probably would have got myself in a lot of trouble when a pastor got back, so I said, I'm not touching this right now. So, so the scripture that I want to start with today is actually uh, to do with workmanship. Workmanship. It, it occurs seven times in the scriptures in that way. It actually has different meanings which... Uh, are represented by different words, but the, but the main word that I'm interested in is workmanship. And you know what you know what workmanship means. You know, like if you have a car that got good workmanship, you know, you don't have a piece of junk. Somebody took some time and effort, and uh, I'm probably going to jump all over the place right now. So, but if you look at this word workmanship in the, in the uh, concordance, we get our word poem poem out of it. Poetic. So when God, well, let me, 
you know what, I better stick to some of my notes or I'm really going to get messed up here. So. so it's found six times in the Old Testament and one time in the New Testament. The first occurrence is in Exodus chapter 31. And I'm, I'm going to read there. You really don't have to. I like reading. That's one thing I did good in school in. I did good in reading uh, and math. And I flunked everything else. So I had bad teachers. Seriously, they were horrible. <laughs> They, they thought I didn't know nothing. So chapter 31, starting in verse 1. Listen to, the, listen to this. This is how amazing God is and what, he, and what he's already done for each and every one of us. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold, in silver, and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Now I looked, I try to find in here where God filled, filled these people up with that, and I couldn't find it. What I did find was that God filled them with his spirit. And I think when you, ha when you have God's spirit, it comes along with the, whole, with the whole deal. All right? So God doesn't have to give you a spirit and say, oh, wait a minute, you're still lacking this, so I'm going to have to give you this and this. No, when you get the spirit of God, you get the whole package. All right? So it continues, and behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahizamak, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee, the tabernacle of the congregation, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table, and his furniture, and a pure candlestick, with all his furniture and all the altar of the incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture and the labor in his foot and the clothes of, serv clothes of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee shall they do. Okay, I know I read a lot there, but so stop and think about this. Is, is there anything that God asked of Moses that he, he didn't equip? He didn't equip the servants of Moses to perform. No. They had it all. They got everything. They had everything that they needed to get the job done. No, they were filled with the Spirit of God and were able to perform all the things Moses instructed them to do. So did you ever get a prophetic word? And this is too bad because I had a pr prophetic word downstairs that I wanted to bring. I had it written down from uh, Phil Capuzio. And I really wanted to share it with you tonight because I know we've heard many times that, what does the scripture say? We know in part, you know, we prophesy in part because we know in part. And, well, I really believe that if, you've, that if you've gotten a prophetic word, you can take and run with that word if you believe it. If you, out in faith you step out and you really feel like, Lord, I really believe in this word that you gave me. And I, I really believe if I take it to its fruition that you'll... You'll, not only will I be blessed, but you'll also be blessed in the midst of it. And, and I think God probably says, even if it wasn't a prophetic word, I'm not saying I've got to be very careful with my choice of words. But I think if, if God says, well, you know what, I think, I, I, think I, I will be glorified in the midst of this, that God will allow you to run with it. And the word to me was that I was going to excel at work, among, among other things that were said concerning work. And I believe it. I had no idea what a cutting tool was when I started working at the shop. Like most of you in your profession. But I had a good knowledge of math, and I have a very creative mind. And I had a boss that was really bad, but I was obedient to everything he told me to do. And I got blessed.
He was a whack job. But he knew we were Christians. And some of the stuff, you know, you don't know this, but some of the stuff that you would come home with sometimes and share with me, you know, from, from a convention that you may have gone to up in Michigan, I would, from time to time, drop something on him. Not because I was trying to be spiritual, because at that time I didn't want to have nothing to do with church. But he was, so, he was agnostic. He didn't want to have nothing to do with anything. So, but he was a good teacher. And, and God blessed me through the job. And a prophetic word to me was that that wasn't why God, that wasn't the only reason why God blessed me. God blessed me to be a teacher in, in the house, which I can tell you a, n- a number of reasons why I'm not. One of them is because I haven't taken it seriously. Okay? If you're going to do something that God wants you to do, number one, you've got to believe it 100%. And you've got to go after it. And you've got to expect that there's going to be opposition to it. Because if there are works of darkness out in the world, and I believe there are, you know, uh, I was going to joke with you today because I was going to say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But... You know, he's in the world. I think he was in my, my printer. <laughs> There's certain things that are still governed by the works of darkness that we have to do with. Otherwise, we'd come in here skipping every time we got together, you know? But we have problems. We have problems. We have issues. We have things that we have to get over. So, so I have a word for you tonight. And the word is workmanship. And, and that word is for, the word is, from ev- the word is for everybody. Because each and every one of you are God's workmanship. God's gifted each and every one of us. We have a spirit. And some of us may, may know what our talents are. Some of us may not. But I'm quite certain that if you start bugging God, he'll, he'll certainly let you know what you're you know, what your talents and abilities are. So, getting back to uh, Exodus, verse 12, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Now get this, they, he just got done telling them all the blessings that, that the craftsmen and the, and the artisans got. And what is he going to say next? Verily, my Sabbaths, you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth, this is tough, shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever doeth in that work, and and whoever doeth work in that Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Okay, now I can read further, but I want want to get back to my notes. So it was to be a sign to set aside a day of rest between God and his people. And the children of Israel were told to observe the Sabbath as a perpetual covenant. The word perpetual here means concealed. Perpetual. It's concealed. Because you can't see the end of it. In paintings, it's called a vanishing point. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with paintings. I always love I always loved I don't know what it is. I have fascination with this for whatever reason. You see a painting that's that's like like a street, and it just keeps going down and down until in the center you got a little dot. Okay, that's that would be the vanishing point. If there's a street that just keeps tapering down and everything keeps getting smaller and smaller, and finally you see the end, but you know it just keeps on going. You just can't see it. It's just at the end someplace. Well, that's this word perpetual. And that's like, I guess the point is, this is to be observed forever, for eternity, of the Sabbath. 
It's something that will never end because it's necessary for us. It's a time with God. It's a time with family. It's a day of rest. And in verse 17, listen to this. Listen how important this is. 17. It is a sign between me and all the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. All right, if God needs to rest and be refreshed, how much more do we? Because as, as stressful, I'm sure, I'm sure creation, you know, from our point of view, had to be a stressful event, you know. I mean, I looked at, I looked at this book Jeremy bought me for, I don't know if it was Christmas or Father's Day one, one time. It's called The Cosmos. And it actually had the, all the different galaxies in there and how there's like over one trillion planets. Well, that's, all, that's what they can see, probably. It's one trillion. It's probably 50 times that. Well, it says in, in, in the uh, book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, We talk about balancing acts. Can you imagine all them, all them planets being held by his word. Okay, so it's, it's like when you work five or six days, you just need a day where you can get some rest. So this verse says that God created and made. Remember those two words, they're very important. I'll probably end up, uh, next time I have an opportunity to come up here, I'll talk about those two words. Hopefully we'll get to it later. It also says that God was refreshed. Let me tell you, if God was refreshed, you wouldn't be, if God, oh, wait a minute, let me get that right. If God wasn't refreshed, you wouldn't be getting refreshed either. Can you imagine if at the end of the six days, God says, ah, I'm tired. You know what? Leave me alone for a while. Just get away from me. Okay, so this word refreshed wouldn't be getting refreshed. This verb appears three times in the Old Testament and three speaks of completion. It means to be breathed upon. Well, who gets breathed upon, you or God? We do. We do. This, but this clearly says that God entered in, into his rest. Well, what does the scripture say about us entering into, into his rest? Well, when, he, we, when we enter into his rest, he breathes on us. It says to be refreshed as if by a current of wind. I have an example in here about how hot it was a couple of weeks ago and we were in our yard. Do you ever, we ever out on a hot day and it's just so hot, all of a sudden a nice gust of wind comes by and, you know, it cools you off. So, so what do you think God wants for us when we're in his presence? He wants to refresh us. So do you think God prefers you looking refreshed or like someone that just ran a marathon or that walks around with a sourpuss? You know, when we come into church sometimes, I've come into church to, at times where I feel like I got, you know, beat up at work or something. Well, you know, snap out of it pretty quick because in the presence of God, we shouldn't be experiencing something like that. Okay, so remember where we started with the word refreshed. In the Hebrew, it's pronounced malaka, and it means deputyship, deputyship, or ministry. It also means employment. When God equipped you, he gave you a job, a ministry. It comes from the Hebrew word malak, 4397 in the Strong's, and it means to dispatch as a deputy, a messenger, specifically of God. An angel, also a prophet, priest, or teacher, an ambassador representing a different kingdom. If, if you want to find it in the New Testament, you're going you're gonna to say, oh, somebody quoted the scripture the other day. It's in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, 
We're his workmanship. Okay, so listen to this. We are his workmanship. The word here in the New Testament means a product. That's what it means. If you look in a concordance, it means a product. The dictionary says that a product is a thing or a person that is the result of an action or process. God started a process when he made us. We're his products. Have you ever look at yourself at a product, you know? But not only that, the Greek word here for workmanship is poyama. In the Strong's, it also means fabric. If you go down to the next word in the concordance, okay, these are all tied in together. Poiasis, and that means action, action or performance. Next word down, poiatis, and that means a performer, a performer. Specifically, a poet, poiatis, signifies a doer, a doer. It's found in Romans chapter 2 and verse 13. I probably don't even have to read this for you, but I'm going to read it anyway. I know I'm saying a lot here. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers. You know, and there's other scripture concerning doers. It's, there's one that says, don't just be hearers, but be doers. Okay? That's all, all tied in with that word workmanship. That's what God expects from us. He expects us to be doers. It's also in James, chapter 1, verse 22. For, uh, I'm not going to go there right now. One more scripture, and we'll go back to Ephesians. Ch uh, Acts, chapter 17. I do want to go, go there. Acts, chapter 17. And verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets. He was addressing the crowd at Mars Hill. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We're his offspring. All right? We're the offspring of God. We're his offspring, a product of him. Going back to Ephesians. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The word created here, you know, I don't know why I keep putting this. The word created here is a very interesting word. They're actually all very interesting words, so... It's 20, uh, 2936 in the concordance, and it means through the, through, the idea, through the idea of proprietorship of the manufacturer. Oh, it sounds like a legal term. I should have had my brother-in-law Jack up here. Through the idea of proprietorship of the manufacturer. That's the word created. Okay, and that's because we're workmanship, and he created us, and he's the proprietor. All right, he's the pro proprietor. A proprietor is somebody that takes ownership of something. All right, that's proprietor and, f and full responsibility for their actions too. So that's why we need to be on our best behavior. S seriously, I'll be, but that's a whole other, I was gonna get into something else and I said, I better stay out of that. So what does that mean? First of all, a proprietor is someone who has the exclusive right or title to something. So if he's the sole proprietor and we're the product, as we read earlier, he's the manufacturer and has exclusive rights to us. 
All right. So, if that makes if that makes any sense to you, it, it makes it made it made a lot of sense to me. So I want to seal that thought with a scripture that I found in First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter six and verse nineteen. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? All right? What do you have from God? Is it the Holy Ghost? Or is he talking about the temple? Or is it both? It's both. It's both. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And you are not your own. That's something a proprietor would say. You know, that's not yours, that's mine. It's mine, I created it. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And then in chapter 13 of... uh, in the book of Revelation, verse 8, it says the lamb slain from the, front, from the foundation of the world. Well, if you want to know why you belong to him, well, that's another reason you belong to him. Because you were bought with that price. Yeah. And I put over here, because I really feel it's true, that that happens to be a controversial scripture for a reason. If he was slain from the foundation, someone had to have killed him. All right. We, we know that's not probably that's not probably true but, he, but in the eyes of God he had already made himself an offering okay but, but you got to really look into that scripture a lamb slain before the foundation of the world and then I wanted just to share my thought with you someone had, had to have killed him if he wasn't then he was creating a world he knew he was going to die for. Okay? Now, this is what, off the deep end. How about this? If he's the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, while he was carrying the cross to Calvary, he was creating the heavens and the earth. That's like, you can't even comprehend that. But if he's, if, if he's, if he's been from the beginning to the end, it's just, you know, it just blows you away. You got, you got to spend some time in a basement where it's like 100 degrees <laughs> to have these thoughts. You got to, yeah, you got to get rid of that. It's burning my head up. This word created is very unique because it always only, I said this earlier, speaks of God and to understand why And to understand why, you have to understand the word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word was bara in a concordance and is of of profound theological significance since it only has God as its subject. Only God can create in the sense implied by bara. The verb expresses creation out of nothing. And in Isaiah, chapter 40, starting in verse 25. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, Who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong, not one faileth. And in chapter 42, this is where my notes get a little... Cryptic. 
42, it says, Thus saith God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretcheth them out, he that spreadeth forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes. You know, it talk, talks about setting the captives free out of prisons. And, but these are all things that, that, God, that God wants us to do. Uh, let me get rid of this. something else. I don't even know where that came from. Uh, so going back to, let me go back to Ephesians. For we are as workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I wrote a couple of scriptures down out of different, uh, different Bibles. Out of the Amplified, it says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, that we may do those good works which God predestined beforehand for us, taking paths which he had prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. The New Living Translation says that we are God's masterpiece. His masterpiece. Did you ever consider yourself a masterpiece? You should. You know, if you think any less of yourself, it's like telling the Lord that, you know, I'm really not happy with this. The Phillips translation says, the fact is, what we are, we owe to the hand of God upon us. We are born afresh in Christ and born to do those good deeds which God planned for us to do. If there is anything good or desire to do something good, he put it there. God's declaration is that he is going to have a holy people created for good works. So let's back up two verses. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We didn't get saved because of our good works. Is that, is that a fact? Or no? That's a fact. I was not doing good works when I got saved, for sure. For sure. It was God's grace. You know, I don't know exactly. I don't know how exactly that works, but I'm glad that it. I'm glad that it worked. By grace we were saved through faith to do good works. Faith in God. So let's turn to Romans chapter one. Not you. I just. I didn't. I didn't mean let's. I'll do that. Chapter one, and verse twenty. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's us. That's us. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay? So let's take four words out of that scripture. Things that are made. Things that are made. Okay? It's like... You remember the show on TV years ago, The Pyramid, where somebody would sit this way and the things behind them, and somebody would rattle off some words. So you'd say, things that are made, you know, and they'd start trying to guess what. 
That's an, that was an old show, sorry. Okay, you'll find those four words in the concordance under 4161, familiar word. Poyama, same word used for workmanship. Okay, things that are made. God's workmanship. When everything that God made, every, and God made everything, so I, I don't know why I just said that. But So if God made everything, everything should know that there's a God. Every, everybody. Somewhere in our lives, we made that connection to God, and here we are. Isn't it amazing that we don't, that we, that we never had this conversation? Pastor, I really think you need to bust that, that wall out so that we can add more seating in this church. Okay? Some of it may be our fault. I don't know. You know, I, f I find evangelism very difficult, especially in this day and age. It's very hard to go out there. But if God wanted to fill this church, he would say, you know what? Step aside. I'll fill it for you. The thing is, people out there choose to ignore the fact that there's a God. Okay? That's the bottom line. And you can hear it all the time. You hear it on TV. People don't want to have nothing to do with spirituality. So, God shows himself to everyone. To everyone. There's nobody that has an excuse. There's no excusing anyone in this world. So let's read the rest of Verse 10. In Ephesians. Wow. Should have wrote all that down. Wouldn't have to keep bouncing back and forth. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The Greek word here for walk is peripatio, peripatio. And I know I got that right because they, they break it down for you and make it real easy to pronounce, you know. It's like Greek for dummies. The Greek word here is peripatio. It means to tread, to tread all around. Walk at large as a proof of ability, a proof of ability. So you like strutting out there. You know, when you're out in the world, you're not, you know, you're not cowering like a, like a coward would. When you walk, you're walking out there with confidence. You know, it's like, it was it Moses that was instructed, you know, wherever your foot is yours. You gotta have that. You, you have to, you know, you have to believe that God wants us, wants to use us to do good works. He's planned all these good works for us. If we don't get on that path, Peripatio, it means to tread all around, walk at large. Comes from two Greek words, peri, spelled P-E-R-I, where we get our word perimeter from. That's where our word perimeter. If you walk around a perimeter of something, you're basically what you're doing is you're encircling it, you know, like they did at Jericho. The other word is patio. And it means to trample or tread underfoot. Use figuratively, uh, figuratively of treading upon serpents. All right? This scripture doesn't say we might walk in the paths God has prepared for us. It says we should walk in them. If you want to learn anything else about this word, uh, Tim's not here, but come to Sunday school. Listen to Tim teach. He's, I think he's on the walking part now. We do the sitting, now it's going to be walking. So. so, God's got a plan and a purpose. You know, I was trying to get that point across, that God has a plan and a purpose for us. He's already foreordained the whole plan. Everything's done. Every, everybody that we're to encounter, all we got to do is step into God's presence and walk out what God has planned for us. Number two, we're a masterpiece we're a masterpiece. We're God's workmanship. We're his product. And we, we have to have that confidence that we, that we can do these things. You know, there was a time years ago, I hated coming up here. I hated it. I really did. It was, it was nerve-wracking because I'm not an outspoken person. 
But I'm going to tell you, I had the most fun this time putting this together. Whether it ministered to you or not, I hope it did. But to me, it did. I had a really good time because every time you get together and, and study, and I noticed this in my own life, and I, know, I already know I don't do enough of it. I hate to use the term, it's like a nail in a coffin. But, you know, it's like a good thing because you're, you're gaining confidence. Because every time you read God's word and you read about yourself in there and you hear stuff like that, that, you know, you're a masterpiece. And the word workmanship means poem. Did you ever read a good poem? Yeah, there's some really good poems. There's poems that make you cry, that make you laugh. All different variations of stirring up your emotions. And that's, what God, that's how God wants us to be. He wants us to, to uh, well, we already know we have the ability. So he's just saying, just get out there and do it. You know, open your mouth. He said what? Just open your mouth. Let the words come out. I'll put the words in your mouth. And that's what God wants us to do. So I guess this kind of talks about what, Ed, you know, I kind of piggybacked off what Ed was saying. We got a job to do out there, you know. We got to get out there and minister to people. Be, you know, I, I believe we're all good examples to people, but sometimes we got to go a little bit further and ask God, you know, if this is the path that I'm on, that I know that I, I'm going to encounter somebody out there that I need to keep an open ear and hear something, you know, because God's always saying something, whether it's to us or to somebody else. And the same way that he contacted me, my wife was in Michigan. She didn't minister to me. It was, it was in the middle of the night. I just, God ministered to me, and I accepted the Lord, you know, so... You never know what God's going to do. All you got to do is just go out there and keep dropping seeds. That, that's all God wants, wants us to do. Okay, so I got another lesson, but I'm going to let you go home. See you Sunday.